And with that, I hereby look to Amy Gregg, Somerville College and Treasurer-elect, to open the case of the proposition on the motion, this House believes we have not remembered them. Thank you very much, Stephen. It is a privilege to have the opportunity to speak in this chamber. Tonight, we come together to debate one of the greatest instances of horror and suffering in human history, a conflict spanning four years which came, claimed almost 20 million lives, a monumental tragedy of bloodshed, pain and lost potential. And we ask tonight whether we have remembered them remember those who gave their lives in the First World War. Tonight, I will argue that indeed, we have not. Firstly, we have glorified and sanitized the conflict in which these lives were lost, and in doing so, we have failed to recall honestly and truthfully the circumstances of the deaths we now claim to respect and remember. Secondly, by failing to properly scrutinize and to remember the political circumstances of World War I and the context in which these brave men and women gave their lives. We have doomed ourselves to repeat the same mistakes and engage in the same senseless slaughter over and over. In seemingly learning nothing, we illustrate we have not remembered those who came before. So what is remembrance? Remembrance is analytically and conceptually distinct from simply remembering. Remembering is where individuals recall events personal to themselves. Remembrance, however, is the collective recollection of historical events, often far distant in time and space from those remembering. Remembrance centres on this collective memory of the population. When we all come together at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, our recollection may be personal to us, it centres on a general, common understanding of what the First World War was, what happened, and what it meant. This common understanding of history is not, however, empirical fact. Historical accounts of any event are shaped by the political discourses that dominated both at the time of the event itself and in the years that follow. Invariably, a dominant historical narrative will emerge and this will determine the main content of the general population's collective memory of a particular historical event, passed on from one generation to the next. Certainly not everything is impossible to verify. We can say with reasonable certainty that 20,000 men died on the Somme that fateful morning on the 1st of July in, 20, uh, in 1916. But with the more flexible and abstract notions relevant to the debate tonight, those of motive, causation, consequences, justification, honour, glory, patriotism. Our collective belief in the presence, absence and content of these is determined uh, by more than objective accounts of dates, numbers and locations. And I submit that the collective memory of the British population in 2018, that which underpins remembrance, is inaccurately constructed that we have misremembered the lives and legacies of those who died 100 years ago in one of the bloodiest chapters of human history. But first, it falls to me to introduce the other debate speakers here tonight. Speaking first for the opposition is Simon Jenkins, a former editor of the Evening Standard and The Times. Secondly <coughs> is Surgeon Commander Andrew Murison, MP, a doctor, naval officer and politician he has served as a Conservative MP since 2001 and is a former Minister for International Security Strategy. Closing the case for the opposition will be Major General Nicholas Kaplan CB, a retired British Army officer and the Chief Executive of Blind Veterans UK since 2014. Speaking secondly for the proposition will be Professor Katrina Pennell, a historian of the of First World War who focuses on the memory and legacy of the war in schools and current conflicts. Closing the case of the proposition will be Do Dr Jenny McLeod, co-founder of the International Society for First World War Studies. These are your guests, Mr President, and they are most welcome. As stated, the collective memory of the British population underpinning remembrance is inaccurate. We do not remember but misremember. 
So what is this current collective memory of the First World War? This can be gleaned from the way in which it is taught in schools, the way it is in which it is discussed in the popular press, and the way in which it is spoken about in politics. And when we look at examples of this, we invariably see a story of patriotism, of nobility and justice, a romanticised and glorified tale. In 2014, Mr Michael Gove, then Education Secretary, carried out an extensive rewrite of the school curriculum, including in the area of World War I, in light of the upcoming centenary. He stated, It is so important that we commemorate and learn from that conflict in the right way in the next four years. And what is the right way? To Mr Gove, it is that World War I was a noble endeavour. He attacks left-wing academics for criticising the leadership and political motivations behind what he terms plainly a just war. Alongside Mr Gove, we see Boris Johnson echoing similar sentiments. He argued that Tristram Hunt, shadow the shadow education secretary's claims that factors other than German expansionism and aggression led to war are fatuous and show he is not fit to oversee history in schools. Similarly, in David Cameron's letter to an unknown soldier, he states those who fought died for our freedoms and future in, again, a just war. And on the, and the British Legion's website, we are told wearing a poppy in remembrance is to give thanks to the fallen who, beginning with the First World War, died to safeguard our freedoms and our values. I submit that it is not the radical left-wing academic bogeyman to which Mr Michael Gove alludes that has failed to adequately honour the memory of those who died. Rather, it is those such as Gove who propagate these romanticised notions of nobility, justice and freedom fighting surrounding World War I. World War I was not a noble endeavour. It was not comparable to, for example, World War II, with which it is frequently conflated during remembrance. There was no monstrous holocaust, no single aggressor promoting ethnic supremacy, compelling other countries to take a stand on the grounds of moral conscience and common humanity. World War I centred on the political battles of imperial powers and their perennial one-upmanship. It derived from the competition surrounding the so-called scramble for Africa, where states, including Britain, competed over their relative rights to expand their empires from the growth in militarism and the mistrust engendered by the escalating arms race between Britain, Germany and further afield. From the growth in nationalism across Europe tied to this militarism and imperialism. Those who died were fighting and dying in the name of politics and nationalism, of empire, not in the name of liberty, freedom and global humanitarian norms. Individuals like Mr Gove so commonly protect the prevailing collective memory of World War I from scrutiny by deliberately misinterpreting this scrutiny as denigrating virtues such as honour and courage, to use his words. But does recognition of the true nature of the World War I conflict reduce the courage of those who fought? No. Their suffering? No. Their loss? No. When those young men faced the machine guns of the Somme and the drowning mud of Ypres, they showed bravery in the face of horrors beyond that which almost any of us in this room can comprehend. We must not disrespect the pain and the tragedy surrounding these deaths. Simultaneously, we must not allow our honouring of these young men and women to blend into a false narrative about what the war was or why it was fought. We must remember that this was a war fought for the politics of the privileged, not the freedom of the masses. That in the context of World War I, Dolce et decorum est, pro patria mori, must remain, as Wilfrin Owen tells us, the old lie told to children desperate for some ardent glory. It must not be how we frame the war itself. We owe it to those who made the ultimate sacrifice all those years ago to tell a truthful story an unglorified, critically examined story of the conflict in which they all gave so much. And this brings me on to my final point, that we fail to properly remember the victims of World War I, not only by constructing this 
false narrative of the conflict in which they gave their lives, but by continuing to repeat the same mistakes. Through our failure to properly acknowledge the circumstances of past conflicts, to learn and to change, World War I has become the war to end wars that famously did not. Time and time again, the victims of war have become the dead when, short days ago, they lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now they lie in mass graves in Kigali, Rwanda, following the 1994 genocide, in collapsed hosti- hospitals in Yemen, where Saudi Arabia, with arms supplied by Britain, continues to wage a devastating war. Amongst the shrapnel of car bombs in Baghdad, in the aftermath of the catastrophic UK-US invasion, they lie, just as they lay in Flanders fields. Can we therefore honestly say that at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we remember them? when globally we continue to pursue the same paths of bloodshed and destruction over and over and over, have we learnt nothing? Why do we have this collective insomnia whereby humanity witnesses loss of life on such a great scale and allows the same outcome to arise again and again and again? Remembrance is about more than simply acknowledging a certain historical event happened. It is about respect. It is about ensuring that the lives of those who died on the Somme meant something, that something substantive and long-standing came from the sacrifice that they were compelled to make. We have done what John McRae warned us against all those years ago, from risk-construing history to continuing relentless slaughter in later conflicts in the name of politics, we have broken faith with those who died. To us, from failing hands, they threw the torch, ours to hold high, to shape a new future, a future where senseless mass deaths became a historical fact, not an ongoing fact of life. And so we have learnt very little from the fate of those brave men and women who gave their lives in the war to end all wars. And in learning little, we fail to honour their memories or give meaning to the sacrifices they made. It is not enough to lay a wreath, to wear a poppy, to televise eulogies, and it is actively harmful to promote the narrative of patriotic glory and justness and to conflate scrutiny of the circumstances of the war itself with disrespect and dishonour of those who fought. In this process, we prevent true remembrance and we destroy the opportunity to learn, to move beyond a world where such horrors can occur. And in every meaningful sense, ladies and gentlemen, we do not remember them.